you very much, um, Friday, for the introduction. And uh, yes, SAC, which actually is, is not directly linked to the University of Edinburgh, we're in Edinburgh, so it's a employer. Um, this is, uh, as you'd expect, an integrated paper, one which has a lot of contributors. Uh, myself, Alison, who is here, Lee Brandia, one of the, the lead authors on it. And a lot of contributions also from PBL, we've heard a lot from in the last couple of days, and I'm going to be talking to their input as well. But also from uh, from IBM, but also GIS colleagues from IBM uh, in Amsterdam. And also the database work done by uh, all by the of his colleagues. So, just a bit of a structure here, the background of the project itself. Um, so a quick discussion of biophysical modeling. Now, Simon Lupton did me a lot of favors by actually describing some of the baselines yesterday. Now, Simon Lupton's plenary yesterday concerned the newly released um, uh, outlook, but we were basing this in the previous version of that, but a lot of, a lot of commonality between the two of them. I've been talking about the spatial data, the benefits transfer, and an example. But before we get there, just to kind of give you a kind of idea of what this is all about, well, the history of the inception of this project, um, I think, is quite interesting. Leon Bratt yesterday asked a question to Simon about uh, the fact that he was going to Wall Street, and maybe it should be the case that he ought to speak the language of Wall Street, which is a monetary language, which is a valuation language in dollar terms. Uh, Leon was in, uh, Leon with Patrick and Brink was involved, well, coordinated a kind of interim study for a team, which was called the Cost of Policy in Action, which looked at what would happen in, in value terms if we were to not intervene, and therefore the uh, global biodiversity outlook projections were to, were to bring forth. Now, the analysis, I probably won't put this just now, maybe in question, but the analysis applied by Leon and Patrick is, is fairly different when we actually approach the subject. But probably the most fundamental difference is that we're not trying to look at the cost of policy in action. We're not trying to look at a scenario wherein no policy change arises. What we are trying to look at is an assessment of policy interventions which might try to mitigate some of the issues and the problems that have been described by Simon um, and PBL and the reporting at OECD level. How we do this is to try and attempt to marry together biophysical policy modeling using the global tree um, undertaken by PBL, there are many people here from PBL, and explicitly look at eight options to counteract terrestrial biodiversity loss. So the context here is that the input to this, to this analysis was the PBL work, which, was tro which had as, as an agenda the idea of looking at the fact that mean species abundance, which we talked about already um, yesterday, um, was, was an anticipated to decline fairly significantly, and what kind of inter interventions might we consider to try and rectify that problem. But then how we dealt with it in terms of this quantum assessment is somewhat different. We take as an input the policy initiatives, but then don't look at MSA per se. What we're looking at is the other side of image globule, which is the land cover land use model, which is extensive, very well referenced, and used by OECD and also used by IPCC. So our economic assessment is value expected changes in ecosystem services. So basically, applying the ecosystem approach at global level. This is a listing of the policy options which, uh, which were investigated um, by PBL and then in turn investigated by us. And there's actually analysis in the main, in the main report for each and every one of these. I'm going to focus on the very first one, agricultural productivity flows to the yield gap, simply because of time constraints. But you'll know already from the plenary this morning, a lot of discussion about, say, for instance, post-harvest sector, reducing post-harvest waste. There's a, a large discussion, etc., about protected areas. And all of these produce very interesting results in their own way. But two of the strongest results are for increasing agricultural productivity and also for reduced deforestation. And when I say interesting results, we are looking at cost-benefit analysis, applying conventional environmental development principles. Okay, so we are looking at the cost side as well, so it's not only an estimation of benefits. We're only looking at literature review to uh, uh, provide us data and information on the cost side, but the, the benefit analysis is fundamentally new, okay, using new data and new approaches. This is a kind of, I think, a kind of economics one on one diagram we'll dwell on, but I think it's useful also in the context of talking about what we looked at. What Simon presented yesterday might be referred to as a kind of 2000, 2000, 2000, 2050 kind of reference point. We're using 2000 as a starting point, partly because the PBL modeling uses 2000 because it's based upon 
the Global Land Cover 2000, TLC 2000, um, biophysical modeling as a framework. So we use 2000, but we look forward to 2050. What we're trying to say is this, we're trying to say, well, if what would happen under the baseline? What would be the delivery of ecosystem services where it would be business as usual? I'm outlining briefly in a, diagram, in a slide here what business as usual looks like, but also Simon talked to that yesterday. We had the OECD projections of the business as usual scenario. We have that as a baseline, but in terms of ecosystem services, you want to know, well, there was that level of provisioning of ecosystem services under the baseline. What would happen if we had a policy intervention? How could we mitigate the issues? So remember, again, we're not looking at these species of abundance here, although I'll look at the changes of MSA in a minute, but looking at ecosystem service delivery and the changes in that service delivery which arise. And this green triangle is basically the policy benefit. We're trying to work out that policy benefit in monetary terms and then juxtapose that with the cost of intervention that we, which we try to find for literature review. This is a very complex diagram, which thankfully, because global has been discussed already, that I would need to go into, but fundamentally what we have here is the image framework in the middle there, which um, includes the kind of socio-economic system, and under that kind of biophysical system, and interactions between them. There are indirect drivers coming into this system, such as population growth and economic growth, and there are also policy responses, such as looking at cultural needs in protected areas. Fundamentally, what we're taking as a given is, is the OECD projections for business as usual. So when you look at that bottom left arrow, policy response options, we consider as the baseline those initiatives which are already agreed upon, but we supplement and keep upon those policy initiatives from the previous diagram that I gave you in terms of interventions that might take place. Now, the image model feeds also into the global model, which then looks at MSC and biodiversity change as well. But one of the key things here is if you look at the, 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 the right-hand side here, biodiversity indicators, we have MSC, but we also have ecosystem extent. So the fundamental difference between the kind of COPE study, what we're doing, is that COPE looked at MSC and the ecosystem extent, whereas we're just looking at ecosystem extent. And the reason for that, and it has its own limitations, but the reason for that is because when we look at the change in ecosystem service value, and try to link that to the extent to which we have high MSA. Well, as Neil was discussing with me yesterday, the, the literature is underdeveloped in that case. We kind of threw that out there and hope that the academic community would respond to that, and to the extent they have. But that is a different type of analysis than one we're doing, which is to basically not look at MSA and quality per se, but look primarily at the extent of land cover. So these are some of the baselines. I'm not going to read over all of them, but what I want to say about them is that the baselines that Simon talks about are the standard OECD ones. We're not having a radical degrowth agenda. We're not assuming something radical in the transformation of the economy. We're assuming the world population grows from 6 to 9 billion. We're assuming a fourfold increase in economic output. We're assuming particular rises in per capita incomes in the BRIC countries. Okay? The other things you can read for yourself. But we're not assuming a radical agenda for business as usual. We're assuming the OECD baseline for business as usual. Then to the pure biophysical mountain modeling outcomes. Now these are now, I suppose, a little bit dated, but still relevant, because they're the kind of thrust for our input into this, into this project. So we have green species abundance as, as an indicator of, kind of, um, of, uh, of habitats and biodiversity. And this is the picture in 2000. You might have seen these before in the interim report. This is the picture in 2030. Okay, it's obviously green, good, red, bad, in very simplistic terms, okay? 2050 gets worse again, and this final chart, I think, looks at the baseline and gives the most informative view, in the sense that you see lots of yellow and red areas. And this is showing the kind of base, baseline change in MSA, which arises if we have a business usual scenario. So to repeat, we're not looking at MSA explicitly, but what we're trying to do is to 